of sense. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to the One World Seminar in Cognitive Psychology, sponsored by the Psychonomic Society. I'm Valerie Camus. I'm the head of the Communication Committee of the Society. And for today's talk, Dawn will be the moderator of the question and answer. Thank you, Dawn. We are extremely happy to welcome Rain uh, Bosworth, for today's seminar. Welcome, Rain. Rain is assistant professor at the National Technical Institute for the Deaf at Rochester Institute of Technology, which is a very impressive institution because there is a specific college for deaf and hard of hearing college student. And uh, before this, Rain was undergrad at the University of California, San Diego, when she immediately been interested in expert psychology and sign language linguistics. Then she did a master's degree on iconicity on word retrieval in American sign language. And after that, she did a PhD on visual perception in deaf and hearing adults, and then a postdoc at the University of Texas. And we are extremely happy to hear what she's going to say today about learning about language from B-model babies. Thanks again, Rain, for coming. And we're looking forward to hearing you today. Thanks a lot. <laughs> All right, is everyone able to see my slides okay? Yes. Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you for having me here. I'm excited to come to talk about my work today. I am very humble because most of my work has been done with peers and I have great respect for all of the people I've worked with who have really worked a lot on sign language and research prior to me. Oh, I want to thank them for their leadership and their dedication to doing all of the hard work. My work is just one tiny piece of the puzzle. We look at what happens to the brain and cognition when deaf or people who use diff when people who are deaf or who use different languages like sign languages are using their language. My work today I will talk about is eye gazing. This is not about language production. It is about how we use our eyes and how we perceive language. First off, I work in Rochester, New York at the Rochester Institute of Technology. Our university is on indigenous land from the Seneca peoples. I would like to recognize the Seneca people's contribution to our space. It is a beautiful area and a wonderful place to live. We get a lot of snow, but we have a lot of beautiful weather too. Today, I am here to talk about the importance of cognition in bimodalism. I will talk about what that is and why it's important, what we can learn from eye movements. I'll give you some background on my research and my four research studies. My studies are all studying children and adults and their perception of sign language. And then I will close out about why this is important for deaf children.
This is a new popular science that's getting a lot of attention now, cognitive science for multilinguals. These are people who understand and use multiple languages. This research includes how people navigate between two languages, how they match the context, and how they learn multiple languages. Here are some example questions from the field of cognitive micro, mi, multi, multilingualism. How do we juggle multiple languages at the same time? How do we retrieve those languages? Do those languages compete? Where are they stored in the brain? Are they stored in the same place or separately? How does being multilingual impact other cognitive functions? These questions are critical. Most folks in the world are multilingual or at least have exposure to different languages. Perhaps not in the United States, but in other parts of the world, most people use more than one language. This is important because we can learn how to effectively teach two languages, which has implications for education. Learning about language helps us understand the mechanics of the brain and what's going on in the processes of the brain. Traditionally, most research is done with monolingual or single, lingual, single language speakers. There is some work done with bilingual speakers, but mostly they're using one mode, spoken languages. So they're speaking more than one spoken language. There is in the field an appreciation for a new group of people that is recognized as bimodal bilingual language users. These are people who use different languages across modalities like a spoken language and a signed language. The most common group of people in this research are CODAs, what we call children of deaf adults. This group is unique. They learn sign language from birth in the home. They have native proficiency in a signed language, but they can also hear, so they're able to learn English in the context of their community. Evidence shows that children of deaf adults acquire language in the same milestones in the same fashion as hearing children with hearing parents. Also, the field is appreciating that deaf children are bimodal as well. We don't often rely on the sound, but we are proficient in English written and reading. So I am bimodal. Many deaf people also are able to hear at some level with assistive listening devices and enjoy music and sounds. So a lot of deaf people can get language in multimodal ways as well. This is interesting because bilingual individuals have a cognitive advantage. We've seen a cognitive advantage in memory, in problem solving, in improved attention control. You can perhaps ignore certain distractions during a task a lot easier than monolingual. So there is a cognitive advantage found by the age of three in bilingual language users. This is fascinating because the brain has two languages at the same time, and these two languages get activated in the brain simultaneously. So the individual has to suppress one language and think in the other or use the other. That exercise provides more cognitive control for someone who uses two languages.
However, not all bilinguals are the same. Bimodal bilinguals appear to have different controls of those two languages. You can use a signed and a spoken language at the same time, and they don't have the competing demands that two spoken languages have. When you're using spoken languages, you have to use one or the other. But when you're working across modalities, you can sign and speak at the same time. Bimodal, bilingual individuals have a different cognitive advantage. They seem to be able to code match and have less competition between the languages. There's a lot of exciting new answers that we have to some of these questions as we continue to study this group. The last point I would like to make is many folks are bimodal because we gesture. We use a spoken language and our hands sometimes, even if it's not a signed language. So in some way, we all use multiple modalities of communication. Now, moving on to the next part of my talk. I'd like to talk about the technology that we use for eye tracking. This technology has been used since 1967. We were able to learn about task demands by looking at eye tracking. This is an old example of a painting. They each show different eye movement patterns. The image on the left shows the eye movement patterns of a person who is asked to identify age of the people in the painting. So the person looked more at faces. In the image on the right, the person was asked to identify how wealthy the people in the painting were. You can see that this individual looked more at the pockets and the clothing of the people in the painting. From this, we've learned that eye movements can actually reflect the demands of the task and the intent of what we're, be, what we're doing and looking at. Unfortunately, we can't ask questions to infants. So instead, we use a passive, natural way to collect data from their eye movements. Of course, when they're sleeping, it's not possible. But with infants, we can measure where they're looking and their gaze patterns to identify what's going on cognitively. Here's an example. That's just a clip from my research that I'll talk about today. From researching with infants using eye tracking techniques, we already know that infants are biased. As an example, at one month old, infants have different gaze patterns than they do at two months and older. it seems as though the patterns change with age. This example shows that a one month old is more likely to look at the boundaries of something. It looks like they're trying to identify maybe where the face starts and ends. And then by two months, they are making assumptions because we think that they know where the face is. So now they're looking more at the details within the face, the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. The eye movement is also different for populations of people. For example, children with autism or children without autism have different gaze patterns. This is helpful to know because we can measure eye gaze well before a diagnosis is possible. 
We can do prospective studies to identify if children later may or may not be diagnosed on the autism spectrum based on their eye gaze behaviors. The eye movement is also a little bit different for bilingual children than monolingual children. And I will talk th about that later today as well. Work that has been done with reading identifies that gaze patterns reflect an individual's language skills through reading. So for example, someone who struggles with language is going to take a longer pause on each word as they're reading. They might also regress while they're reading and go back to a previous sentence. Proficient readers use their peripheral vision and have a wider range in their visual field as they're reading. They're using their parafoveal region. There is a long history of research with reading and we have learned a couple of key things. The complexity of the text in the task will impact eye movement. The language skill of the individual will impact their eye movement and the goal of the task might change the way an individual moves throughout the text. So those findings, we are unsure of how they translate to watching sign language. We again have a lot of evidence about reading and language proficiency, but we don't have the same research about people watching sign language. We don't understand the complexity or the frequency of the language and how that impacts the way people watch during sign language watching. So what do we need to consider when someone is looking at sign language? First, Words, when we read, are in the fovea, the center of our vision. Unfortunately, sign language is not produced in the center of our vision like words are on a page. That center circle on this model is our fovea region. That is where our vision is most acute and clear. That's a very small area where someone is looking at another person and has the clearest vision. The parafoveal region is the second circle. Most of sign language occurs below this region. If you see the yellow circle in the center, that's basically the epicenter of where most sign language occurs. And that's five to 10 degrees below the mouth or below the eyes, excuse me. That means the hands are articulated and information is being transmitted in the lower space, not in the center, most clear part of our vision. We also want to consider how task demand will change the way we gaze and 
gaze patterns? So that is one of the big research questions that I'm working on. I'd like you to imagine with an eye tracking test, you are asked where people look when they are watching someone use sign language. These images show where folks look when they're looking at sign language. The image on the left are native users of sign language. They do not look where the hands are articulated. They look at the mouth. So this means expert native signers hyper-focus on the face and the mouth region when they are watching someone using sign language. On the opposite end of the spectrum, on the right graph, these are individuals who have learned sign language in college and have maybe taken two or three sign language classes. So they're still learning. These individuals also look at the face, but their gaze is more distributed throughout the areas of interaction. This means novice signers have a greater range of eye gaze patterns. And when the story is more complicated and the task is more demanding, they tend to look down at the hands much more. Native signers are looking at the face, even though the hands are being articulated at the torso below the mouth. Now, what about babies? Infants are born into the world with a lot of stimulation. The world is busy and chaotic. Infants have to identify what is language, what is important, and they need to know what they need to pay attention to. Evidently, children are looking for their parents, but at the beginning, infants, they don't have any help figuring out where to draw their attention to. We suspect babies might have some sort of innate sense of what is and is not important to identify for language. And infant's vision is not that great. By one month old, infant vision is about 20 over 600, so it's pretty blurry. By two or three months old, it's a little closer to adult vision, like what you see here in the photo. We hypothesize that infants arrive on Earth with some sort of hypersensitivity to language. I call this their language radar. I work mostly with infants who acquire spoken language, and we know that research has been done that shows they acquire that language quickly. By one year old, that hypersensitivity to any language reduces and they attune more to their home language. That process is called perceptual narrowing. Perceptual narrowing can happen for sign language as well with visual shapes that the hands make. The research that I'm presenting today is just part of my work. I am interested in identifying what children are sensitive to. How do they know that something is language? Now, moving on to the next part of my talk, I will talk about my research. I will walk us through four studies. The first two studies were done with infants who do not know sign language. That's important part to remember as we go through this work. 
I screened for participants that parents reported their children have never seen sign language at all. They've never seen a video. They've never seen a person using sign language. I want to identify what infants are already sensitive to without knowing any sign language. Then the last two studies were done with children who know sign language. Those are bimodal babies who use both sign language and spoken languages. In th these studies, we asked how language impacts attention. So the first question is, how is it that babies distinguish between stimuli that's ling linguistically relevant versus something that's not language? So if I cough or say the word cat, if I, you may understand that I've said the word cat, but it may be difficult to understand that when I'm coughing at the same time. So which part of that sound is language related? The same is true for any body movements. So if you watch what I'm doing now, just fixing my hair, putting it behind my ear, how would a baby understand if that was salient language? So there are some body movements that are language and language related and others that are not. So because we believe, or the hypothesis that because babies are hypersensitive to finding language in the environment, they are able to distinguish between body movements that have salient language features. So in our study, we showed three categories of stimuli, and they were three different category or body movement category types. So these are a few examples of what the babies actually saw during the study. So what we did is we had a native signer and we gave that native signer an ist, a list of English words. And we left it up to that person to determine how they would produce those signs without any facial expression. We balanced the three different types of body movement uh, types. And we made sure that the signs were produced within the area of the upper torso or what we call the sign space. What we noticed about the three types is that, well, the first type we called grooming, and these are just movements that mimic uh, actions directed toward the own person's body, toward their self. The second type was pantomimic or pantomime. And again, we gave the native signer a list of natural types of gestural movements that they could pantomime. So again, we said, we asked the native signer to not use any words in the pantomime category. And then thirdly, we gave them a list of ASL signs that they could produce without any facial expression. Now, the second and third categories, the pantomime and the ASL words are both using language. And in both cases, the uh, 
production is seen as a whole instead of seen in its in distinct, uh, distinct parts. So it's seen as one whole unit. Words have phonology and they use hand shape. So you can break a word down in its, into its distinct phonological parts. So even though each of the three categories looks similar, it's the third category that contains phonology in, in its uh, words that were produced. And the other two do not use phonology. So please feel free at any point in time to stop me and ask questions if you have any. But not seeing any questions, I'll, I'll move on to the next slides. So this next slide shows the timeline. It, the experiment in total took about seven minutes. So the infants were able to watch a video that contained the three types of uh, body movements and they were uh, put into a series of blocks. And those blocks of seven chunks each were repeated. We kept the repetitions of the three types and we were able to time the infant's gaze that they uh, gave to each of the three categories. We test two age groups, tested two age groups. One was six months of age and there were 22 infants. And the other group was 17 infants that were almost one year of age. So this is how we analyzed our data. First, I'll show you the raw data. That's on the right, uh, pardon me, on the left. Then the center figure, figure, you'll see where we identified the particular areas that we wanted to statistically um, analyze to determine how much time was spent looking at the face as a whole, the eyes, the mouth, and then the upper torso signing space. And you'll see the red blocks on each of those areas of the figure. Then we produced a number of scores that reflected the face preference or how long the infant looked at the face. Every infant had a score that reflected how long their eye gaze was attuned to the face. And if there was a negative value, it meant that the infant was looking more at the hands than the face. Because remember, the signs and the gestures were produced without any facial expression. So the infants may have been more interested in the parts of the body of the figure that were moving, where they were producing signs, because nothing interesting was happening on the face. And these are the results of that study. We did find that six months old, six month old infants do have an ability to differentiate between the three types of body movements. But by the time an infant reaches almost one year of age, they no longer differentiate between those three body types. This is particularly true for infants whose home native language is spoken English. At the age of six months, what we found in that group of infants is that they were particularly attuned to the movement of the hands or what we call articulators. So they were looking at the articulators because that's where the language was produced. So I believe that they were looking for language that their language radar was attuned to the movement of the hands. By the time the infant reached one, there were some social, they become social beings. They become social beings. And so their visual attention 
is beginning to focus more on the face. So let's move on to study number two. In this study, I kept the same categories of age, six months and almost a year, but I was trying to determine what bias may be when these infants are looking at the stimuli because language has many layers, overlapping layers of distinct, unique parts. And I wanted to determine where an infant's uh, or baby's attention was focused. Were they focused on consonants or vowels or the intonation of the production of those sounds? Were they focused on words or full sentences? This was my postdoctoral work. It was work along with Adam Stone. Together, we wanted to uh, research that to see if infants, it was really Adam's idea to look at sonography. Sonority. So, sonority. Sonority, or the sounds produced in the language. I'll explain what that is in the coming slides. So sonority is really the variation that takes place that impacts the loudness or softness of a spoken word. So it, it is inherent in the syllables of the spoken language. So if you have a word that's a, a string of vowels, it won't have a lot of sonority. It will be rather flat. The same is true for a string of only consonants. It won't have a lot of sonority. There won't be a lot of intonation within the production of that spoken word. It's the combination of consonants and vowels that give us heightened sonority and more interest to the word. So we were exploiting the property of sonority within the language. I'll give you an example of what that means. So for example, the word jelly, there's a lot of variation within the word jelly. It has high sonority. In, there are other word examples that you can see on the slide that don't have high sonority. If you are using speech, saying words like bliff have high sonority, but something like LBIF doesn't have high sonority. It has low sonority. Sign language has both high and low sonority in the signs as well. For example, the sign for suspect, very small, small production space near the eye. Not a lot of movement in that sign, but something like the sign for dream mm -hmm. has high sonority. The sign for dreaming has a lot of movement, both near and away from the face. Sonority also is applicable to fingerspelling as well. So the name Ian, I-A-N, it's a, it's a boy's name, that has low sonority. There's not a lot of movement in the fingerspelling in the articulation of the fingers. That's very different than the word John or the name John. When it's fingerspelled, you've got a lot of movement, wrist deviation and fingers moving in spelling the name John. So when we fingerspell a word, we're typically borrowing it directly as it is from English. And this fingerspelled word is not understood by each of its singular letters. In the same way, speech is understood as one whole unit. You don't understand the word cat as C-A-T. You understand it as cat. The sounds blend, blend together to create a whole unit. That's called co-articulation. Co-articulation happens in speech as well as fingerspelling. So for example, if you watch me, I'm going to be signing the name Charlie. And it's not spelled as C-H-R, 
C-H-A-R-L-I-E. It's spelled as Charlie, it's one unit. And as one unit, one whole, it's understood as a word. So sloppiness in fingerspelling production is actually a way to have greater sonority and preserve the sonority that, in a way that it can be perceived by the person watching the signs. So when we showed babies stimulus that was finger spelled words, we chose a word that had a very low frequency of appearance in typical spoken language, tritinopia. So it was spelled initially as T-R-I-T-A-N-O-P-I-A, which is not the way you would say the word. So it was finger spelled by each singular letter as well as in one smooth flowing movement. My sense was that the whole unit, the co-articulated letters to form a whole word would be more interesting to the babies. Now there are no uh, formal rules that defines a well-formed word for, versus an ill-formed word, but when you see them and you will see the video, you can tell very clearly a well-formed word on the left and on the right, an ill-formed word. The What differentiates those two is which letters the signer determines to drop to create greater sonority and more fluidity. In, a, in an ill-formed word, there's... Adult, adult signers agree. Adult signers agree. And when we showed this to non-signers, they couldn't tell the difference between a well-formed word and an ill-formed word. Somehow their perceptual ability to differentiate that in sign language had diminished to the point where they had no sense of a difference. Our test subjects were infants who had no exposure to sign language. And this is what that stimulus looked like. So you might have a little bit of understanding more the sign, that the sign being produced on the left has more motion and more movement in its co-articulation. There's more, more wrist movement, more movement of the hands and fingers, and babies preferred one or the other. Six-month-old babies preferred the fingerspelled words that maintained high sonority. However, that preference goes away by the age of one if they don't have continued exposure to sign language. They lose the ability to determine the level of sonority within a co-articulated produced word. So our conclusion from those first and second studies is that there's definitely a critical period where an infant has the ability or the language sensitivity. Babies as young as six months old have the ability to determine linguistic features in movements that they see, and that diminishes by the age of one. This is for babies who use spoken language. Now I turned our attention to the babies who use sign language.
In this third study, we wanted to know how does language experience influence perception of language? So if parents use language, sign language at home, does that lead to the infant being able to identify what is or is not language any better? Remember our first study with the three body action types, we're using those same stimuli here, but we're studying two groups. One group around age five used spoken English. Another group was hearing, but their parents use sign language at home. The folks who use sign language at home and spoken English are bimodal bilingual. We see a huge difference in the populations in the results of this study. Children tend to look at the face. They have a strong preference for the face for all three types of body actions, especially the sign language. And those are for bimodal babies or bimodal children. Even for children who don't know sign language, they show a preference for the face although slightly lower than the bimodal children, they are looking down at the signs. And what about the eyes compared to the mouth? This is interesting because children who are native sign language users primarily look at the mouth. Both groups seem to look at the eyes with the same amount of preference. And the amount of time that an individual gazes at the mouth increases with age. This is fascinating. The mouth is not where sign language occurs. Remember, sign language is being articulated in the torso on the chest. It would be very easy for someone to look at the hands because if you look at the mouth, the hands are blurry. We would think that people would move their eyes so their fovea is at their center of attention. There is a lot of literature showing that bilingual babies are also looking at the mouth. There are two theories about why this might be the case. First is language maturation level. What is the individual's mastery of language? Babies don't speak yet, so maybe they're looking at the eyes. Oh, sorry, I flipped that around. Babies who do not speak yet look at the mouth. And then once they learn spoken language, we see a shift in their gaze towards the eyes at around one year old because they are familiar with spoken language and they are socialized to understand that information can come from the eyes. And that's with monolingual infants and bilingual infants as well. The other idea here is that infants look at the mouth when language is unfamiliar to them. Almost as if they're trying to figure out which language is happening. Once that language is familiar, they're able to shift their gaze towards the eyes again. There has been other research as well that supports that people are looking at the eyes, but by six month old, babies do start looking at the hands and then they eventually shift their gaze back up to the mouth by one year old. So it seems as though these spoken language theories are not applicable to sign language acquisition. We don't have an explanation for this at the moment. However, this suggests that maybe babies are using their language radar to look for the articulators.
In this case, infants notice that language is occurring on the hands and are looking at the hands. Then that gaze shifts to the face later as they get older and more proficient with the language. When a child has proficient language of their home language and social experience, they know to look up at the face rather than down at the hands. My last study, and then I'm almost done. This study was a natural setting where we showed children an ASL story. These stories have a lot of facial expressions and are very narrative. They're like a fable or a fairy tale like Cinderella. We put the children in front of the video and let them do their thing. There wasn't a specific task or two demands or anything. We just asked them to watch the clip. In this study, we tested with children who were five years old who know sign language and they loved these stories. I also tested a group of children who did not know sign language. As you can see in this picture, this child is unsure of what's happening. I was able to explain that this is sign language. This story is Cinderella. Please use your imagination. Both groups found the story engaging and entertaining. They looked right at the screen the entire story. Very few of them were distracted and shifted their gaze away from the screen. Here is an example of a child who uses sign language at home. Oh, it looks like it froze, just a second. Okay, here you might have noticed where that child is gazing. They are not looking at the lips. This child is not lip reading because this child is not deaf. This child does not use sign language. With adults who do not know sign language, they're more likely to look down at the hands, but that child was looking at the face and the mouth as well, even though they didn't know sign language. So again, CODAs, children with deaf parents at five years old are displaying native gaze behaviors and are not looking at the hands. Therefore, I argue that part of becoming an expert signer is knowing how to perceive language. Not using your fovea, but using your paraphobia and your peripheral vision. You have to perceive language that is outside of your clearest vision. You need to use your peripheral vision to comprehend language, which is very different than how we read. There's a lot here on one slide, I apologize, but I wanted to keep a simple summary of conclusions for all of my experiments. First, we found that sign language experience changes eye gaze and eye gaze patterns and how we perceive the world and how we attend to other people. We identify signing expertise at a young age and it does not need to be taught. Children surrounded by deaf adults can acquire that behavior and know where to look and how to perceive sign language without being explicitly taught. Remember, this is about bimodal babies as well. So I first argue that all infants are amodal. They have sensitivity to any modality. Maybe a good word would be equimodal. They are equally sensitive to any language modality. All infants can learn a visual or a spoken language. However, that sensitivity diminishes with age and experience with a home language. 
If your home only has spoken language, your sensitivity to signed languages will diminish. So what exactly are infants sensitive to? We think there is temporal patterning and the changing in syllables, whether that's through finger spelling or sign language, they look at the changes in pattern. This is important because that's one cue that we see in both spoken language and sign language. The languages are so different. It's fascinating that we were able to find this common denominator. We believe this common denominator could be sonority in both signed and spoken languages. My last slide is the most important. What about deaf children? I have not tested any of this with deaf children. However, we did show that CODAs, children of deaf adults who use sign language at home and spoken language elsewhere, develop expert language perception. Most deaf children do not have sign language exposure in the home though, so that is not the case for everybody. Most deaf children are born to hearing parents who don't use sign language. Most hearing parents, for some reason, choose not to learn sign. Recent studies show that even if hearing parents learn just a little bit of sign language, that can be enough to provide linguistic benefit to their children. They can learn the language together. Other work shows that deaf children without full language access because they cannot hear in their environment at home, if their parents do not use sign language, it will result in cognitive consequences later in life. They will have various developmental delays and language delays even if they learn spoken language or ASL later in life. Oh, that's it. Thank you so much. And I am now open for questions. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, I turned on my video. I still just see uh, Dr. Bosworth, though. So uh, I'm John Weatherford. I will be moderating the chat. I have uh, some individual who has written in the Q&A. Feel free to do that. Um, I have someone else who's raised their hand, so I'll get to you kind of as we go. Um, first off, I just want to say, Rain, that was a great talk. I really appreciated it. I learned a lot. I feel like I leaned in a lot just to study, 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 because it's just kind of outside my area. Definitely fascinating work. Uh, Karen Emery is uh, also uh, gives you kudos on your talk. Great talk. I have a question about the finger, finger spelling sonority preference study where six-month-olds distinguish well-formed and ill-formed finger spellings, but 12-month-olds did not. But non-signing adults were able to distinguish good and bad sonorous items, correct? My question is, how and why are non-signing adults able to do this? Thanks. Great, thank you. In that study, what we did was identify several rare words in English that were about the same length, around seven letters. We then created well-formed and ill-formed stimuli to use for the experiment. We asked participants, which looks good? When people who don't know sign language did that task, they by chance were able to identify which was well-formed or ill-formed, which makes sense. It was mostly up to chance. We were also able to confirm that our construction of the well-formed and ill-formed 
fingerspelling matched what expert deaf signers use. Then we ranked the stimuli and we picked the top five words that were uh, most agreed upon by expert signers who are deaf as to what was ill-formed or well-formed and we used those in the experiment. Karen, I hope that answers your question um, based on very elaborate response. Um, our next question comes from someone in the audience, uh, uh, Lilia Risman. Ah, feel free to um, use your audio and, and ask the question or type it in the chat, Lilia. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. This is really interesting work. Um, um, Lilia Rissman, UW Madison. Uh, I was wondering if you have predictions about what deaf children learning sign deaf deaf infants would do in your first study. So there we have this process of change from I believe it was six months to eleven months. Uh, hearing children learning spoken language, and that could be a process of perceptual narrowing, uh, where they're becoming more accustomed to, more, more adapted to spoken language. But the direction that they're moving, looking more at the face, is also the direction that, you know, uh, deaf people learning sign are also, you know, they're ultimately also looking more at the face. So I'm wondering if you have any predictions about deaf infants who are, um, either deaf or, you know, bimodal who are being adapted to use sign, uh, do you think that that trajectory would look different? Would they move to the face more quickly? Would there, would there still be a period of like emphasis on the hands? What do you, what do you think about that? That's a great question, thank you. I would love to use this opportunity to show you some of my other work as well. <laughs> Here we go. Can everyone still see the slides? Yes. This is the only research that I know of that has been done with deaf infants and visual attention. This work shows that deaf infants are actually able to understand what another person is doing with their eye gaze and where they're moving with intention earlier. As you can see from this picture, there's a person looking, let's say at me, and then they look away. As a deaf infant, the deaf infant is likely to follow. We call that gaze following. So if the other person looks away, I'm going to look at their direction. And that's gaze following. Deaf infants do this behavior, exhibit this behavior a lot earlier. They develop the ability to follow the other person's gaze much sooner and much younger than hearing infants who don't know sign language. So that being said, how that applies to this work, I would predict that deaf infants who use sign or are in a signing environment, we would see the emergence of these mature eye gaze behaviors and controls a lot younger than we would see in CODAs who also have hearing language accessibility as well. I think I might need to change the experiment a little bit though, because this study right now is in a natural passive environment where someone is watching a video of sign language. We might need to include specific tasks to help us identify language proficiency in those studies. So that's our next goal. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a question from an anonymous attendee in the Q&A just about the amount of visual access we have to various individuals. So when you're sharing your screen, Rain, um, apparently some individuals are having a challenge seeing both you and the interpreters. Uh, the question is whether or not we can switch focused video 
to uh, different individuals, like first you, then the interpreter. I don't, I don't know the settings of that. Other, other options may just be to choose a gallery view uh, and not share your screen unless there's something like critical that you're sharing. I think that might resolve it. I think that I think that might uh, help if if it doesn't anonymous attendee, please let me know. Um, OK, so I, we have another question in the Q&A. Um, do your findings hold true across all different signed languages or are they specific to ASL? Well. The properties of study two, the sonority study, I believe that would be universal. Sonority is universal across languages. It's not specific to English or ASL. But of course, languages vary in how sonorous they are. For spoken languages, some, for example, have more vowels than others and less consonants. That could parallel to sign languages as some are more or less sonorous. We have found infants who are sensitive to sonority is universal. It doesn't seem to matter what the sign language is, just that they're seeing that sonority principle. We do need to study other folks outside of English and ASL. Those are the only languages we've worked with. It would be interesting to compare people who use other sign languages and spoken languages as well. Also, if I can add, the role of mouth movements in sign language is different across languages. So what I'm doing right now, you'll see a lot of English movements on my mouth for the benefit of the interpreter. Mouthing does have a grammatical and an emotional role in sign language, but that varies across languages. Some sign languages rely on mouth movements a lot more than others, whereas some languages have no mouth movements. It is possible that this is unique to ASL because ASL has a lot more mouth movements than other sign languages might. Thank you. Um, I have a question of my own because I'm interested in this um, parafoveal cue as kind of an effort reduction for that top-down processing when individuals are just, you know, able to still get the gist, I suppose, of even the ill-formed signs, right? Is it the case that, first off, I'm, I'm wondering, do individuals who are creating ill-formed signs, do they know that they're kind of doing it in a sloppy way? Are they consciously aware of that? or is it just on the receiving end? And then similarly, do like con like conversational partners that kind of engage in conversation often with one another tend to kind of ride into some sort of ill-formed um, default as opposed to thinking about uh, being more well-formed? I'd have to think about that just one moment. I'm sorry, can you tell me the first part again? I'll answer. <laughs> oh yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll ask the two questions separately then. Are signers aware that they are using ill-formed signs relative to well-formed signs? Great, thank you. That's not really something we're aware of. It's the community of ASL users understand the well-formed signs without any formal rules. It's an agreed upon rule of the language. In spoken language, let me think of an example. We can articulate more clearly and slowly when we put our mind to it. If 
we're speaking with somebody that is not a native speaker. We might speak slower or more clearly. We might enunciate better. But for example, if I'm talking to my husband, I speak very quickly. I might fumble over my words or co-articulate my words. For example, I am going to something. That, when you're speaking to someone you know, turns into, I'm going to, or I'm going to, you know, we co-articulate or abbreviate the way that we say that when we're speaking with somebody we have familiarity with. And I'm not sure about how conscious we are. I think we speak quicker. Our production is more efficient. It saves time and energy when we know the other person is going to understand what I'm saying. And I think there's parallels in sign language with that. Thank you. You, you answered both of my questions. Okay, we have um, Annika asks, do you see a lot of inter-individual variation within your groups or are the group members largely behaving in similar ways within groups? Can you read that question again? Do you see a lot of inter-individual variation within your groups or are the group members largely behaving in similar ways within groups? Hmm. Let me think about that. I'm not sure if I have an answer for that. Um, it's almost like, it's almost like if I were to speak about dialects, that type of variation within users of a common language. Um, I don't think I can speak to that particularly right now. Um, if anyone can help. <laughs> And if anyone else in the groups want, if anyone else here present wants to answer that from the audience, you're welcome to. I'd actually like to address a question. Uh, if I can answer. Brenda's question, Brendan's question. So you bring up a good point, Brendan. The model signer who was making the gestures and the pantomime and the signs, even though they were creating gestures, the model was a native signer who uses ASL. So for that model signer to try to inhibit their knowledge and fluency with ASL and not have it impact their gesturing is almost impossible. So yes, I would, I would say that there's some contamination of the gestures that they created because of their fluency and use of sign language as a native user. So that is a really good point that you bring up. So that could possibly be why the reason, uh, the reason why six month old babies perceived the pantomime gestures and the signs to be similar because six month old babies were focusing on the torso sign space area. But for the body grooming category, they were focusing on the face. So it is possible that the reason the pantomime and the signs were seen to be more similar with the um, 
they're focused on the same torso area, it could be because of some contamination and influence of the native signers language knowledge and use. Good. Uh, Brendan says thanks, although I think you can see that. All right. Do we have any other questions from the audience? All right. As, as the mother of a 15-month-old, I looked forward to getting her into eye tracking studies when she was younger, but there just wasn't any opportunities. So I hope you get lots of really kind of engaged, uh, active participants. It seems like such a fun thing to be part of. And your your work is just, I'm sure, just brings smiles to everyone's faces. Yeah, I would like to say that the uh, eye tracking with infants, it's actually rather easy. People think it's difficult, challenging work, but I find it easy enough. It's, it's right. It, we're working with things that infants are interested in, like look at the puppy dog, focus on that. And so it's, they're interesting images, they're engaging images, and they're things that infants and, and young children are interested in. The magic number isn't necessarily six months. Well, it does seem to be the magic number as opposed to seven months or younger or a little bit older. Six and, months or seven months. Pardon me. Uh, the stimulus duration seems to be a magic number of six or seven minutes. So beyond that, we expect the children to become disengaged or distracted or look away at something or be distracted by something else. But it seems within uh, within that six or seven minutes, whether the child is familiar with sign language or not, they can remain engaged to the stimuli. So um, I would have to say my final take home message for today's talk is that I believe that all of us are multimodal. I believe that all of us use our hands and natural ways to communicate. I believe that babies are both visual and auditory as well as tactile. There is a protactile sign language that's a newly emergent, emerging language uh, that individuals who are deaf and blind use. So that's a creation of a protactile sign language that includes its own morphology and, and um, phonology. So that's exciting new emerging work to study. Absolutely. I agree. Very exciting. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Bosworth. We appreciate your time. Um, and uh, for the One World audience, um, we have another uh, seminar next month. Look at our website to see who's up next on deck. But uh, thank you very much, and we hope you have a great day. Bye, everyone. Thank you.